Um, yeah, thanks to Roland, Pablo, and others. It's a pleasure to be talking in front of an audience, and not online, like last time. So thanks a lot for, for the invitation. Um, so I think that there have been several talks about machine learning force fields. And uh, I would like to talk about machine learning force fields, but more about electrons. So most of my talk will be concentrated on electrons. In particular, as some of you might know, I'm a big fan of many electrons, and in particular, long range effects, uh, beyond the traditional pairwise treatment uh, of, for example, van der Waals interactions. And so I will try to connect these two topics. So what if you have many electrons? They interact over wide range scales. What are the new effects that emerge? And whether we can or cannot treat them in current machine learning force fields. Um, so of course, um, you know, this is me plus many other people. So uh, most of the work I will give credit to the students and collaborators uh, as I go through the slides. So um, as usual, you know, this is done by a lot of bright PhD students, postdocs, and collaborators uh, in computer science, physics, chemistry, and so on. Now, I think in this uh, field that we are here, computational chemistry and computational physics, we have uh, what I would call a new standard model. Uh, so the standard model is defined by three fundamental pillars. So you have quantum mechanics, you have statistical mechanics, and you have machine learning, which is a bit a new kid on the block. But uh, I think we have very little understanding of how these three pillars interconnect. So even if you forget about machine learning and you think about quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics, if you solve your Schrodinger equation for each new configuration, you effectively change in your Hilbert space. Um, because your geometry changes, right? And uh, for that reason, we actually have very little understanding of how even quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics interplay. So can we, for example, provide the same representation for the evolution of wave function and in general electronic effects, electronic interactions? Do we really understand how if you, you know, your peptide falls in, in water, uh, do we understand how, how statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics interplay? So I will demonstrate with an example that the, our understanding is pretty limited, and there is many, much more understanding that needs to be achieved in this field. But machine learning actually uh, is not only good for fitting uh, force fields, but it's actually very good for obtaining insights, and it provides this glue between quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics, as I will demonstrate by actually the first application example in my talk. Now, there are also differences between um, um, machine learning and first principles of quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics. And I think this logo has been used by several people. I think it's also used by Pavlo in a bit different way. Um, so we've recently published this uh, review article in Chemical Reviews together with John Keith, uh, who did a sabbatical in my group, and Bing Quing Cheng as well. Um, and so basically we made this analogy between a snail and a rabbit, and of course our first principles methods are like a snail, they're very, very slow to do the calculations, and machine learning is like a rabbit because in principle it can provide much quicker uh, to evaluate surrogate models. Nevertheless, if the snail gives the wrong information to the rabbit, the rabbit will run very fast, but it will run in the wrong direction. Right? So for this reason we need to achieve synergy between both of them. And so let me demonstrate a first application where I kind of demonstrate the synergy and how we can use machine learning to understand a bit better the first principles of quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics. So recently, um, these two uh, PhD students in my group, Adil and Valentin, um, have tried to achieve precisely this. So essentially, we asked the question of what features do you need to have in a machine learning force fields in order to achieve chemical accuracy for large molecules? Now, large means different things to different people. Um, you know, people doing full CI, uh, four atoms is probably already large. Uh, people doing dense functional theory with uh, uh, van der Waals interactions, maybe 1,000 uh, atoms is, is large. So what we have tried to do uh, is also create data sets uh, which are uh, in for increasingly large molecules. So this is, for example, the MD22 data set. 
which we have recently published, uh, where we have molecules from um, you know, 40 atoms to uh, 400 atoms, roughly. And uh, this is a new benchmark for um, machine learning force fields beyond the traditional data set, such as the MD17 data set that many people have used. And for example, in this data set, you have this uh, system, which is one of the smallest ones. This is alanine tetrapeptide, so it's three uh, alanine residues terminated with, uh, uh, with functional groups. And so you can then take this uh, molecule, you can run molecular dynamics using DFT, and you can calculate reference data, which in this case means atomic forces and energies using, for example, dense functional theory plus many body dispersion, which I will talk about a bit more detail later. And so this data set looks something like that. So here is an ensemble of uh, atomic configurations that you get if you run molecular dynamics trajectory at uh, room temperature. So basically, our 94 what it does is it folds and unfolds, right? So the two ends connect, it folds, unfolds, it folds, unfolds. And so this, you can then take those configurations, compute uh, uh, atomic forces, and this is your reference data. Now, um, so for any for arbitrary quantum mechanical system, if you have in atom-centered basis set, you can always use second quantization approach for quantum mechanics to project arbitrary quantum interactions to just pair atom interactions, so atom-atom interactions. This is always possible, right? So quantum mechanics allows you to do this. Now, of course, this projection is conformation dependent. So if your conformation changes, the matrix of interactions will change. And so this is what I'm gonna show you now. So we can represent interactions for any atom-centered basis set in, as, a, as a fully connected graph, right? So the um, nodes of this graph are atoms, and, uh, um, uh, and the edges are the connections, right? And even if you have a very small molecule, like this 42-atom alanine tetrapeptide, you have many, many different connections, right? So it looks like a very dense graph. But of course, you can partition this graph into chemical interactions. So you define some, some local environment, let's say five angstrom away from every atom. This would be your local features, and the rest are non-local features. And of course, there is a, a linear number of local features. These are you know, chemical bonds, essentially. And you have a squared number of non-linear features. Now, if you construct a very accurate machine learning force field, this is uh, constructed here using our gradient domain machine learning, or SGDML approach, which is a global force field that can include all interactions in, 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 the, uh, in the system. So essentially, we use a Coulomb matrix, or a Hessian of the Coulomb matrix as a descriptor. We can reconstruct this graph right, to arbitrary precision right, uh, with GDML. It's a, it's a fully global model. We don't take any cutoffs like people do in neural networks. And this allows us to construct an interaction matrix. So what I'm showing here on the right is an interaction matrix average of a thousand configurations in a data set. So each point here is actually a distribution. So on the diagonal, you have essentially self-energy, so self-forces really, because this is a force. So essentially this matrix, every element measures how an atom I contributes to the magnitude of the force on atom J. So the diagonal elements are essentially self-forces. The off-diagonal elements are contributions to the forces from different atoms. And so, of course, you see that the diagonal, so elements close to the diagonal are the largest ones. This makes sense. You know, chemical bonds are stronger than weaker interactions. But you also see that there are many, many features for atoms which are further away. Right? So this means that you cannot throw away those interactions because they are very important at different scales. Now, this matrix here looks quite complicated. So what we can do, and this is real power of machine learning, we can say, let us start to throw away features, which means that we take this graph, fully connected graph, and we start throwing away features by just doing sensitivity analysis on the uh, predictions of, the, of a machine learning model. And if you do this, you realize that you can throw away a lot of the features without losing chemical accuracy. So you can still predict energies to kk out per mole and forces to kk out per mole per angstrom by throwing away a lot of the features. So in this case, you can throw away, um, um, you know, about 400 features still, right? And you can still get a chemically accurate force. 
And so instead of having now a fully connected graph, you now have this graph below. It only has 344 features. Of course, still short range features are essentially preserved in their entirety because chemical, you cannot throw away information about chemical bonds, right? otherwise your molecule will decompose, right? But you can throw away a lot of the non-local features. And if you look very closely at this long range part of the interaction graph, you realize that there are actually some very, very important edges, and there's actually some really interesting topography going on. It's not just random, right? So this graph represents real interactions that are important for the molecule. And then you can again visualize the force interaction matrix, and you realize that now it's much simpler, but it still has chemical accuracy, right? So you don't need all those uh, N squared features. You only need a certain number of selected features that encode the quantum mechanics and the statistical mechanics of the molecule together. A better way to analyze this is in the following way. So let us take now, for example, buckyball catcher. Uh, that's uh, you know, a more interesting system, let's say, to look at the interactions. And we can ask the question, uh, if you want to accurately predict a force on this orange atom, or the yellow atom, sorry, what are the atoms that you need to include in your interaction graph? And while, of course, you will find that you need close by atoms on the buckyball, but you also need atoms which are, kind of, which are much further away in order to get the chemical accuracy. You can do the same analysis for a yellow atom on this uh, catcher complex, and you see the same thing, right? You need close by atoms, of course, because you need chemical bonds, but you also get atoms, for example, on the other side of the fullerene. So which have pretty you know, far away from, from it. And so if you look at these plots, what you see is that in terms of long range interactions, what interacts are not atoms, they are not some plane waves like what physicists love, right? They are quasi particles. They're essentially fragments. They're fragments of your system. And these fragments are very clear in terms of the topology, in terms of the geometrical uh, constraints that you have in your system, which are determined both by the quantum mechanics and by the statistical mechanics of, of your system. So this is a very important point. So, you know, chemists prefer to think of bonds, physicists always prefer to think of a scattering phenomenon, which is described by plane waves, but nature does not obey the chemist's picture or the physicist's picture. Nature does what it can, right? And so this is an unbiased result from a machine learning force field, right? We didn't do it by hand, we just train the machine learning on accurate quantum mechanical data, and then from a machine learning model, we can, we can ask those questions. What interactions are important? What really interacts with the molecule? And what interacts are not atoms, they're not full systems, they're components of the system, they're fragments, right? So they're fragment-fragment interactions, which are very non-trivial. Now, another thing we learned from this work, which is, I think, really fantastic, is that for this few molecules which we had, right, we found that you can reduce the quadratic scaling of the descriptor to a linear scaling. Right? There's a few points I have to say, right? You would need many more molecules in order to know whether this is really a general result or this is just a, a, a result of, of, of this selection of molecules. But what is interesting is, um, if that's true, right? That's a, that's a great message. You can always construct a linear scaling descriptor not a linear scaling machine learning model, but a linear scaling descriptor for arbitrary complex molecule. Now, what we also found, which is a challenge, is if you analyze the features that you need in terms of this graph that I just showed, the features are not transferable between molecules. So different molecules need very different features. So the fragments that interact between different molecules are very different. And, uh, and, and so um, I think that's just because of a representation of this matrix in terms of atoms. I think there are other representations which could make those features transferable, but that's something that we are working on uh, at the moment. Okay, so how do we go from, from here, from uh, this, you know, uh, not so small molecules, right? So buckyball catcher has about 100 30 atoms, and we've applied this analysis to about 400 atoms, but we would really like to go to much larger systems, um, and to realistic applications, to you know, biomolecules, to interfaces. So what is missing, uh, and, and, and what do we need to incorporate in our machine learning force fields to really obtain quantum mechanical accuracy for real materials? Now, one thing that, of course, I love, uh, and I've worked a lot, is Van der Waals interactions, and, and Van der Waals interactions are, are everywhere. 
right? They're not only uh, you know, in noble gas crystals or in small molecules, but they're essentially everywhere, right? So, so water has been proven to have strong van der Waals interactions. Graphite, of course, uh, uh, proteins uh, um, largely fault due to van der Waals interactions. And, and even in things like energy materials, which are usually, you know, you think of electrostatics, uh, van der Waals interactions make, make a significant contribution. And I will show one example in the next few slides. So how do you include van der Waals interactions? Well, the usual way is uh, some pairwise correction, um, such as uh, Grimmer, D2, D3, D4, or, or tkachenko scheffler or the uh, Baker-Johnson XDM method. But that's, um, that's very approximate, right? And that's not the true quantum mechanics. Uh, so the true quantum mechanics is many body. And uh, of course, the problem is that uh, you cannot solve the full uh, van der Waals or the full dispersion energy problem using electrons simply because there are just too many electrons and your Hilbert space is, is exploding. So what we propose to do is to map the problem of computing many body van der Waals interactions by projecting an electronic system to an auxiliary system of quantum harmonic oscillators. And uh, I'm, I'm not going into detail. This is uh, a lot of you know, decades of work, you know, 15 years of work in my group. And, and, and we are still actually working on that because there's still a lot of things to do in, de in describing long range electron correlation or van der Waals interactions. This is like the DFT story or the semi local DFT story, right? Semi local DFT is still not finished. If you ask John Perdue, uh, he's still thinking about this. I think the dispersion problem is, in, in some sense, easier, but in other sense, much harder than the semi local DFT. DFT, and so this will go forever, I think. I don't think it will stop ever. So there will probably be D5. <laughs> if you ask Stefan Grimm, he doesn't agree with me, but I think this will happen. Um, now, the DFT plus MBD method is actually implemented in many codes, uh, both in quantum chemistry codes, such as QCAM, and in solid state codes, such as WASP and uh, FHI AIMS, and so on. And uh, the last version of MBD, which uh, I think is really broadly applicable to everything that we have tried, is so-called MBD NL or MBD non-local, which we have recently published uh, with, with Jan Herman. Now, what I find especially reassuring and, and, and really um, fantastic is that beyond academic success, uh, actually MBD is really the de facto standard used by, by pharma. And uh, every day they are running crystal structure prediction uh, pipelines using DFT plus MBD, largely uh, the package that Markus Neumann has developed. Markus Neumann runs a consulting company called Avant-Garde Molecular Simulations, and he has proven that MBD essentially yields uh, results which are indistinguishable from experiments for many, many different crystals. So there's a recent Nature article, I think published two weeks ago, where actually uh, they demonstrated that you can, uh, MBD yields essentially indistinguishable results from experiments for 40 different drugs, uh, for, phase, for phase transformations of 40 different drugs. Um, and, and they actually convinced pharma to release this data up to, up to this paper. There were five data points in the literature for phase transformations between drugs in this paper. There are 40 of them, and, and MBD, DFT plus MBD, PB0 plus MBD in particular, is really, um, you cannot distinguish it, right? So you can really use it as a substitute for, for experiments, or at least before you do experiments, you, you really do calculations using uh, um, DFT plus MBD. Now, you can not only get very accurate results uh, using DFT plus MBD, but you can get completely novel discoveries, and you can realize that uh, nature doesn't follow textbooks. Um, so, um, for example, if you read textbooks, usually it's assumed that if you have uh, homologous molecules, for example, acenes, from benzene to pentacene, that if you put them on surfaces, in this case, gold surface, it's an inert surface, so the interaction is mainly van der Waals, that the, uh, the absorption energy, so the interaction energy, should scale essentially linearly with the number of pi electrons of, of, your, of your molecule. Um, and in fact, if you do um, pairwise dispersion calculations, so these are, the, these are essentially um, um, these green uh, squares here. So this is the adsorption or desorption energy, it doesn't matter in this case, as a number of pi electrons. 
Uh, there are measurements. So this shows temperature program desorption spectra uh, from a mass spectrometer for the different ACNs from benzene to pentacene. And from there, you can integrate those curves and you can get an experimental adsorption energy. So, um, and, and here is a line, right? So I just take benzene as, as my reference and I scale the adsorption energy with a number of pi electrons, right? For the different ACNs. And you get this line. And now if you do DFT calculations with pairwise dispersion, here I'm using van der Waals surf method, but you can use Grimes, D4, or kachenko um, and, and you will get the same result. So, so the, for larger ACNs, uh, all points lie on this, on this line, right? On this pi electron line. But nature doesn't follow textbooks, so nature follows this behavior, right? So it's nonlinear behavior with a number of pi electrons. Why? Well, because there are collective polarization effects, right? The polarizability of ACNs does not scale linearly with the ACN size, right? So even in benzene, the, 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 the parallel polarizability, right, is twice larger than a perpendicular component of the polarizability, and this becomes actually more and more pronounced as you increase the size of the, of the molecule. And, and for this reason, the van der Waals interaction behaves actually highly nonlinearly, the system size. And you can get this effect if you use DFT plus MBD. It perfectly reproduces the experiment, while any pairwise approximation would give completely qualitatively wrong results here. Another work which I really like is a work from Reini. Uh, he is in the audience, and he will talk tomorrow. And this is really fantastic work on, on so-called standing molecule on, uh, on the gold surface. So this, this, this comes from, uh, motivated from experiments by the group of Stefan Daltz in, in Jülich uh, and Christian Wagner, uh, who is in the same group. And, and basically, they, they recently had this great nature paper where they demonstrate that they can put a molecule, upright standing molecule, on the surface which thought to be impossible because van der Waals interactions always prefers, of course, uh, um, a configuration, a line configuration, because that's where van der Waals interactions are actually amplified. But they demonstrated that at 4K, right, they can take a molecule with the AFM tip and they can put it up, then they can withdraw the tip and the molecule is still standing upright, it's not falling down. And this was a huge surprise. Um, any, all attempts to reproduce this by calculations failed because the molecule would always fall down, right? Why they failed? Because people were using pairwise dispersion interactions. If you use many-body dispersion interactions, as demonstrated by Reini, uh, um, so he did this work, you essentially find that the, there is a barrier which is significantly higher than in any pairwise dispersion, and this reproduces experiment to uh, you know, few, few, a few Kelvin, essentially, which is, is great accuracy. And this happens because the energy profile of van der Waals interactions is essentially a much wider oscillator when you include many-body dispersion effects than when you just use a pairwise approximation. And so this increases the barrier and, and explains the experimental observations of this stability of this upright standing molecule, which I think is a, is a really great result. And this is, of course, important for nanotechnology for, for, for getting different arrangements of molecules. Okay, now let me give you another example of recent work. This is unpublished work, which um, um, highlights the complexity of treating real materials, um, um, where dispersion interaction makes an important contribution, but not the main contribution. And, and this concerns uh, recent work from, from Swastika, who was a postdoc in my group, and she looked at this um, electrode material, so solid state uh, electrode materials for, as for lithium, uh, lithium super, so, so they're called lithium superionic conductors, and these materials are called argyrodites, so there is a wide range of them, and essentially you, you have a very complex framework, and you incorporate different ions, so you have lithium ions, right, which flow, uh, uh, which diffuse, but you can also control different halogen atoms, right? And experimentally, there is a big surprise because people expected that as you increase the polarizability of the halogen, so as you go, for example, from chlorine to iodine, the diffusion rate should increase because uh, those uh, heavier um, uh, halogens are more polarizable. And polarizability should actually make the, the framework uh, um, essentially less, uh, less harder, right? And so the, the, the lithium should flow. But then experimentally, they found the opposite thing. So if you increase the polarizability of your halogen, the, the flow actually becomes much, much uh, less prominent. And that was a big surprise. 
And this materials are a mess, right? You need to get everything right. You need to have the right powder repulsion, you need to get the right electrostatic, the right polarization, the right dispersion interactions. So we had done about 20 different functionals, and, and what we demonstrate here, and I show some of them just here, that only uh, HEC06, so a good hybrid function, you know, it can be PB0, HEC06, it's the same thing, plus MBDNL, so the, our latest version of many body dispersion interactions, plus thermal corrections, actually get pretty close to the experimental cell structure. All other functionals, if you correct them by thermal vibrations, they would give really wrong results. Um, more importantly, in order to get the lithium diffusion rate correctly, you need to correctly describe this uh, um, the structure, the, the halogen lithium structure. And it has to be symmetric. That's what experiment tells you. You have to have a symmetric bonds between lithium and chlorine. But most functionals, uh, you know, fund device corrected functionals, uh, non-local fund device functionals, uh, DF, uh, functionals with pairwise dispersion correction, actually distort this this octahedra, and they lead very, very asymmetric bonds. And this is wrong, experiment doesn't see it. So we find that only when you include many body dispersion interactions, you actually symmetrize the bonds, and that's extremely important to get the diffusion rate right. Um, so then you can calculate the, the diffusion rate, you actually calculate the barrier for diffusion of lithium as a function of a descriptor which we, which we uh, developed. This is a, a product between a chemical um, environment and a, and a geometrical environment. And you basically find that when you use DFT plus MBD, you get a structure property relation which is a perfect line while all other functionals just give you random results, right? So this is really a demonstration how and many by the dispersion effects are not just a quantitative correction to pairwise dispersion, they're qualitatively different. Like in the case of this standing upright molecule, right? You get a qualitatively different result. The molecule was stabilized. In this case, you get a structure property relation between a diffusion barrier and a simple geometrical descriptor that is qualitatively different if you do not include those many body dispersion effects. Okay, the final point I want to make is now, you know, having uh, uh, demonstrated all these applications and novel insights that you can get, so what is the effective range of interatomic interactions that we really need to, uh, uh, to include in, in, in our machine learning, learning force fields? Do these interactions decay at any distance? And I would like to come back to my picture of the analysis of effective interactions in large molecules where I said that basically what interacts are not atoms, what interacts are fragments. They're really quasi-particles. Of course, those quasi-particles change depending on, on the system that you treat. So now let me um, demonstrate that uh, if we take this argument further, so if we basically change the size of our system and dimensionality of our system, then we can obtain completely novel scaling laws, and essentially interactions can propagate to macroscopic distances, as I will show you as an experimental uh, result. Um, we, we started this uh, analysis actually quite some time ago uh, in, 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 this, in, in this paper in 2016, where we basically looked at the fun device interaction between different nanoscopic objects. So for example, uh, a nanowire, a carbine nanowire, and a protein. And once again, uh, here the question is, what is the interaction scaling law as a function of separation between a wire and a protein? And if you uh, assume that what interacts are atoms, then all that you have to do is to sum up pairwise potentials between atoms. And since the interaction is fun divides, you only have to sum r to the minus six potentials, right, between atoms. If you do that, you get this boring line, right? Because these are essentially one-dimensional systems, so you go from r to the minus six to d to the minus five, because you integrate over one dimension, and so you would get this. But this is wrong, right, because there are many body effects. So what interacts are not atoms, what interacts are again fragments, they are polarization fragments. And if you do many body calculations, then you find this behavior example, for this nanowire protein. So um, basically, this, what, what I show on the y-axis is the power law exponent of the van der Waals interaction. So this is basically the, uh, the, the, um, the slope of the logarithm of the energy as a function of separation between the two objects. And you see that this power law scales. It runs with the distance, right? So it will converge to d to the minus 5 very, very far, I mean, 50 nanometers separation. But until that point, you actually have a completely different interaction than the pairwise interaction. Because once again, what interacts are fragments. What interacts are polarization fragments, not atoms. 
Same thing holds not in just in nanoscale systems, but in proteins. So in this case, we are looking at the, um, at the interaction energy, the van der Waals interaction energy between a protein as it folds and, and water, water environment. So uh, here we are taking just classical molecular dynamic simulations uh, using any force field, and then we are computing MVD energy for the full system. So these are a few thousand, actually about 15,000 atoms. And uh, what we can compute is the radial distribution function of the energy uh, as a function of separation between the atoms of the protein and atoms of the water uh, environment. Um, so in a pairwise picture, of course, there are only pair interactions. And so if you look at the distribution of the energy, you find this red curve. So basically at five angstrom separation between the protein uh, atoms and the water, the fundamental interaction has converged. This is just the R to the minus six decay. If you take Leonard Jones potential, Grimes, D3, D4, or Kachenko Schaffler method, you will get this red curve, right? It doesn't change. But if you do many body calculations using MBD again, you, re you find that the interaction, the radial distribution function decays like this blue curve here. So it actually never decays. So the decay is at 30 angstrom, which is the size of the, of the water box. If you, if you make the box larger, the decay will be slower. If you make the protein larger, the decay will be slower. So essentially, there's almost never uh, a decay of the interaction. Okay, now well, final one minute, final example. So actually, we asked this question with a very um, a great postdoc I had, Pavlo, who is actually an experimentalist at, at, at MIT. And, and we wanted to see whether the interaction would decay, the van der Waals interaction would decay at the macro scale. So he designed an ingenious experiment where he takes a macroscopic cantilever. So this is a piece of silicon, right? And basically he measures the interaction with some underlying surface. And what he can do is he can grow several layers of graphene on the surface. And he can measure interactions at macroscopic separations, one micrometer, two micrometers away. And so, of course, microscopically, there should be no interactions. In fact, you should not see any difference if you have one layer of graphene, 10 layers of graphene, 20 layers of graphene, or even HOPG, right? Highly ordered paralytic graphene. But what he observes is completely different. So if you measure at contact separation between the cantilever, so when cantilever starts bending on the surface, you get this force as a function of the number of layers. So it converges slowly to HOPG limit. And this is kind of like what you would get from a simple calculation. But if you measure far away from a surface, instead you get a curve like that. So basically, the force increases with the number of, of layers of graphene, and then it completely drops down for HOPG. That means that as you increase the number of layers of graphene on the surface, the interaction behaves in a highly nonlinear fashion. To see this more, here I show the full curves. So this is the separation. Here is the force. One layer for two layers of graphene, four layers of graphene, seven, 14, 21, up to HOPG. And what you realize is that the power law completely changes. From D to the minus three on HOPG, this is what you would expect, to D to the minus four, but the force decays faster, but the magnitude of the force is way larger on top of um, thick layers of graphene than on HOPG. This means that they are much more polarizable per area than HOPG. This highlights many body effects, and these many body effects are measured by a macroscopic tip. Right? So it's, it's a huge macroscopic object that feels that nanoscopic force from just a few nanometer structure on top, on top of the surface. So this just demonstrates that van der Waals interactions are everywhere. They exist for macroscopic separations, for macroscopic objects, and they even scale nonlinearly for macroscopic objects, which again is a complete distortion uh, or deviation from a pairwise picture that we all, or many of us use. Okay, with that, I, I come to my conclusion. So I've uh, talked mostly about how quantum mechanical effects propagate to large distances, and what implications does it have when we uh, run dynamics and when we use machine learning to analyze this uh, interesting um, synergy between statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics. But actually, there is much more to do. I hinted already to you about second quantization approach to understand interactions, and I think that we have these three pillars, quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, and machine learning, but the fourth pillar that we are missing, and that's actually what I'm doing in my ERC advanced project, is I think we really need quantum field theory to understand the connection between these three pillars. And I don't have time to say why, but uh, I leave this to the questions. <laughs> Thank you very much.
questions? Well, maybe you can explain a little bit about quantum field theory. Right. So, so, so there are two, two aspects of it. So, so basically, uh, I think I already hinted it in the beginning of my talk when I showed the, um, this projection. So quantum field theory can be used in two different ways. So first of all, of course, you can use quantum field theory to go beyond the Schrodinger equation and quantize your field. Uh, and this is usually done when you have optical excitations. But you don't have to have optical excitations. In fact, the interactions between the vacuum field and, and, and the, the matter actually become uh, quite non-trivial when you have large systems. So for example, if you have two atoms, right, and you quantize the field, then the van der Waals interaction changes from R to the minus six to R to the minus seven. But we have absolutely no idea what happens when you have two large proteins interact. No one has done those calculations, so no one knows what Casimir effect will be for large systems. And for that, you actually need to quantize the field. And uh, that's what we are trying to do for really large systems. Uh, the second uh, way how quantum field theory can be used, which I think is, is very important, is, is what is shown here. So essentially, it allows you to provide the same Hilbert space for um, changes in geometry. So you can understand how wave functions change as you change your Hamiltonian, right, for, for a system with fixed number of atoms. And, uh, and so you can use those second quantization procedures and the um, essentially number, uh, occupation number representation, like the Dirac model, in order to uh, embed your wave function into, into your statistical uh, fluctuations of your system. And that's, I think, very important because we need to understand how wave functions are connected and how these interactions propagate. So that's, field theory can be used for that, and we haven't used it yet. So it's really an, an, emerging, an emerging field. More questions? Okay, let's thank Andrea. Thank you.